Ballet Academy School to admissions, there were just a couple of minor points of correction so far as the Guardian was concerned. And point one, in relation to the mother, she went into a mother and baby foster placement and under the PLO process, the Guardian understands, but she came out of the residential process on the week beginning of the 13th of March and is subject to a community placement. <coughs> Again, the Guardian understands under the PLO process. So just so you can explain for our benefits exactly what you mean by the PLO process. My I think I know what you mean, but I, just so I'm clear. My learned friend said she was under proceedings. So that would have meant that the local authority where she is in the East Midlands would have applied to the court and all those things would have been done under the court process with court orders. The PLO process is a series of protocols that have been put in place so that the local authority do not issue proceedings but follow best guidance so far as various assessments take place. Anyway, so proceedings are contemplated or either contemplated or started? N well, in this case, you think they've been started? We, no, we do not think they have. Oh, sorry, this is all the PLO process. Okay, so it's pre proceedings, a part of a pre proceedings process, which may not lead to proceedings depending on the outcome. Just so. Okay. And she's got she's passed the first stage and she's got a, she's in the community with the child now. Yes. Just so. That's the guardian's understanding. It's quite difficult to get information from the local authority where she lives. That's one of the issues that this local authority has during the course of the scheme. They're in special measures. <coughs> okay. That narrows the field as to which authority it is. But I'm sorry? That narrows the field as to which authority it is. Yes. <laughs> Slightly, but not that much. Um, <laughs> my Lord, the second point was your Lordship, uh, Lord Justice Baker, said that the father, when my own friend took you to something in relation to the elder child, yeah. Your Lordship said, well, the father played no role in the proceedings. And uh, the younger child's father, I thought. Correct. But the older child, that, well, that was my mistake. The older child's father was a part of the proceedings. In, indeed. He was yeah, represented it's, it's, by counsel, although my learned friend for the elder child's <coughs> admissions included the um, line, he's so laid back as to be recumbent. Okay. Um, Referring to his client? Yes. Well, at any rate, he did take. He was a party. Yes. But the, but the this the child with whom we're principally we're concerned. Her father was not. Correct. Yes. yes. Agreed. The other point was, um, your lordship, you you asked one of the friends called a question. Did, does the developmental needs not point clearly one way or the other? Did I say that? Indeed, you, well, that's my note of your question. Uh, well, if I did, and, and anyway, I'll make, make your submission. I, I, it sounds as though I, 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 I've misspoken, but you carry on. What's and and you had a follow-up question, does that affect the quality of the placement? And my learned friend, Miss Gould, answered it with the, with the first word, yes, before going on to explain. And my lord, um, I, I suspect on behalf of the Guardian, the answer would have been no, but for a different reason. So the Guardian's case in front of the judge was that the developmental needs did point one way and pointed towards a placement order. That was his case and, and the way it was put by him. Um, the local authority submitted to you that the level of neglect, compensation, the eldest sibling caring for the youngest sibling, that caring role. And, and the Guardian commented on all of that, but his, his point was more towards the, the developmental needs themselves of the younger child <coughs> and the reason why she needed a placement order and nothing else would do for her was because of the level of engagement and care <coughs> that the foster care that the adopter would need to give to the child. So that when my lady friend Miss Chowdhury was uh, cross
cross-examining the Guardian, she uh, asked him about that, uh, and he began to give an answer, uh, to which the judge interrupted him, saying, well, you're going to be giving the usual reasons, aren't you? Uh, and so that it, it submitted on behalf of the Guardian is, is part of what's going on in this case. There's a preconceived view by the judge in relation to placement orders. My learned friend from the local authority <coughs> describes it as the move of the fulcrum in the balancing exercise. We don't have this in evidence before this court, do we? No, my lord. You, you, you have it purely on the case put by the local authority. Can you point to something in the Guardian's report in which he deals with this specific point you're making about how the developmental needs of the younger child would be better met in adoption? I cannot, because it really came out during the, the moments when he was giving oral evidence, because one of the things that the judge raised with him and, and asked him quite a lot of questions about was the making of a contact order in addition to a placement order. And so the, the learned judge said, well, you, you haven't dealt with this in your written evidence. The social worker hasn't dealt with this in her written evidence. Um, I want to investigate this particular issue with you now in the witness box. And so there's quite a lot of oral evidence around that. And the, the point that I made in the skeleton <coughs> argument was that the Guardian said, placement order no contact order for this child. And in the judgment, the, the judge doesn't analyse why the Guardian said that, how the Guardian came to that conclusion, and the evidence that the Guardian gave to the judge orally directly as a result of the learned judge's questions to the Guardian on the point. Is it referred to in your closing submission? Yes. Uh, sorry, in my... Close... Well, in your closing submissions to the judge, yes. do we have those? No. I only made three points in relation to closing submissions. Point one was contact. Okay. Were there written submissions or no. not? I see. Thank you. So the Guardian game doesn't deal with this particular point in his court. <coughs> Indeed. It was... It was it was something raised by the judge during the course of the hearing that he wanted to hear, to hear evidence about from the, the Guardian. And specifically, that the, as to whether the child's developmental needs would be better met in adoption. That, that, was, that was one point, and then the second point was, should he make a placement order with a contact order attached? Okay. And the Guardian did set out in, in his analysis in the report the advantages and disadvantages of the options, as he saw at that stage. Yes, my lord. Th this point, the, the first of those two points, the developmental needs issue, whether that would be better, they would be better met in adoption or adoption, that didn't at that stage feature in his analysis. No, again, that was something that came out very much on the last day of the hearing because you've heard my learned friend Miss Gould tell you that the, the, the judge raised the issue about the foster carer and whether the foster carer could go on continually caring for the younger child. And the guardian had had a number of discussions with the foster carer uh, and he was of the view that there was no way the foster is working to care long term for the younger child and that was because they'd explained to him that they were reaching towards retirement age they had a lot of retirement plans they gave the guardian a lot of detail about their retirement plans and so his, his words to the judge they have well thought out plans and, and thus although they might in their hearts want to care for this child the reality is they're not going to one of the other things he was he was asked about at that point about development was what was happening between <coughs> the foster carer and the child. And the guardian
Harvey even said to the judge, this foster carer has her faults, but in one respect, she's the best foster carer I've seen in 20 years of practice because she emotionally, in a way that I've never seen with any other foster carer, attempts to be that close to the child, to advocate for the child, to have that impact for the child, and you're not going to see that ever again in a foster carer, given my 20 years of experience, you're only going to see it from adoptive places. So he was, he was talking about developmentally how she was with this foster carer and linking it directly to the difference between an adoptive placement and a foster placement, and the fact that this particular foster carer was exceptional. And then there was the point where Ms. my little friend Ms. Gould told you that the, the foster carer had phoned in and said, no, I am going to care for the younger child during the course of the hearing. And, and the guardian was sceptical about that. Said, That's her heart. It's, it's not actually her head. Uh, and that's actually proven to be correct in the course of the hearing. But it shows her emotional warmth. My lord, my lady, I'm, I'm not going to <clears throat> take you through my skeleton. Now, but it's, it's essentially that point about the Guardian's evidence compared to what the local authorities say, and towards the majority of what the local authorities say. I'm going to make one final point. Public policy. Why did Parliament enact placement orders? And you all have seen the history to this. It's, it's got cross-party support, it's got lots of research behind it. And it's because of the change from 1976 through to 1989, and what happens after 1989. So it's the Adoption Act 76, Children Act 1989, and the difference between what was happening in the past with adoptions being mainly mothers who had a certain stigma and so young children being given up for adoption in the 70s and early 80s and before, through to when the Children Act comes into force in subsequent years. And there's a need for children in care who are already in the system, who are already looked after, to be adopted. And the mechanism from 1976 and the early 80s with adoption orders freeing for adoption were it was deemed by Parliament to be too slow and too cumbersome and <coughs> damaging to children in care, and so they enacted placement orders. And what you have here, it submitted, is where to draw the line when the court looks at parliamentary intention of placement orders. Because Again, difficult cases sometimes make bad law. If, if, if you're going to go down the path of saying this judge was right, rhetorically, in future care proceedings, when is a placement order ever going to be right? And it's submitted that, that this case would break the parliamentary intention of trying to speed up the process of getting children out of looked after care. Well, that's, we could debate that whole afternoon <laughs> as, to, as, to, <clears throat> as to whether you're starting in the right place. Yes. The model law of adoption in this country starts with Reeb in yes. the Supreme Court, the recognition that following a series of cases in the European Court, Rights, particularly why, most la latterly, why see in the UK that there needed to be a reset. Did, did her lordships don't say that, but that lordships and ladyships don't say that, but it's the effect that happened with the nothing else will do line of authority. That's where we start, it seems to me. Uh, how can one start with case law when statute law is there? Surely one starts with the statute well, and I, it looks at the judicial well, rights. Start with, we start with the Human Rights Act. We've had to reevaluate so much of our law, including our <coughs> statute-based law, 
for the light of your writer. Well, I think we better. It's an interesting point. For my part, I'm not sure it's going to be of much assistance. Uh, and I'm, I'm in danger of straying into human rights points, which would uh, be in the Lord's territory. I, I, my Lord, I'm, I, I won't go any further with it, but it is a rhetorical question. If, if there's no placement order in this case, when, it, when the issue is sibling contact between two siblings aged eight and two, or between two and four times a year, and that stops a placement order, when you ever do they make one? Thank you, my lord. Do you want to add anything? No, I'm very grateful for the consideration. <coughs> yes. <coughs> we'll rise uh, for a few moments to discuss the next step. All right. <coughs>
address your council through you. Uh, in view of the urgency of this case, we have decided that we will announce the outcome of the appeal now, uh, but the reasons will be given in a reserved judgment as soon as possible, but not today. Uh, the outcome of the appeal is that the appeal is dismissed. Uh, as I've said, we will give our reasons uh, as soon as we can. Uh, they will be circulated in a draft confidential judgment in the usual <coughs> way. And can I stress, particularly for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with the court's procedure, that, <coughs> that it's very important at that stage that the confidential draft is treated as embargoed. Uh, it's an opportunity to correct typographical errors and other obvious factual errors. It's not an opportunity to re-argue the case or uh, to use the draft judgment for other purposes. And this court takes any breach of the confidential embargo extremely seriously. And it can, in certain circumstances, be a contempt of court if it does so. Um, now, can I ask you this? Uh, <coughs> Are there any other orders that need to be made today? In the normal course of events, the court makes its orders after judgment is handed down and is usually able to do so on the basis of uh, either agreed uh, orders for the parties or on the basis of brief written submissions. But is there anything that the court is required to do from your point of view today? May I just check 